Hi, good afternoon, everyone. The title of my sharing today is The Overview of the Kings of Judah from King Jehoram to King Josiah. The theme of the Bible is the history of redemption, about God's plan to redeem us, mankind, from our sins. The Bible states very clearly that the only way to be safe and to enter the kingdom of heaven is through our Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, verse 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, to fulfill God's plan of redemption, God gave us different covenants along the way to drive the world history during that period according to his plan. So, covenants, as we have learned, are the links and the means of fulfilling his work in actual history. At the centre of God's administration is our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the seed of the woman promised in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And this is also our proto-gospel. So from the proto-gospel, we have the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Sinaitic covenant, the Davidic covenant, and the new covenant of Jeremiah. As we know, the entire Bible is written all about Jesus Christ. So to better understand our Lord Jesus Christ, we need to study about His genealogy. And so here we are learning about the genealogy of Jesus Christ recorded in Matthew chapter 1. And we know that this genealogy recorded in Matthew chapter 1 is categorized into three periods, each period consisting of 14 generations. We have learned about the first period of Jesus' genealogy, and now we are coming into the second period of Jesus' genealogy. The second period of Jesus' genealogy is from David until the captivity in Babylon. This is the period of King's generation. So the reference material that I'm using from, first definitely from the Bible. You can read about the kings in 2 Kings chapter 8 to 23, 2 Chronicles chapter 21 to 35. And the genealogy that we are studying is in Matthew chapter 1. Secondly, the material I'm getting it from is from the fourth book of the History of Redemption series called the God's Profound and Mysterious Providence as revealed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ from the time of David to the exile in Babylon. And I'm using the material from chapter 12 to chapter 19 of the book. So one question that I have is, what? then drives the history of this second period, the king's period. It is the Davidic covenant that God gave to David. So David also starts this second period of Jesus' genealogy. In the Davidic covenant, we have learned last week that there are three elements to it, of which God made a promise regarding David's descendant, and that is, he will raise up his descendant and establish his kingdom. God promised to establish the throne of his kingdom forever. This is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 13. So, now let's see how God's covenant to David pushed and drive this second period of Jesus' genealogy. There are 14 generations, like I mentioned, in each period. So over here, I have listed down the 14 generations in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. You can see the first and second generations, King David and King Solomon. They are the kings of the united monarchy, as filled with a green box. Then from the third generation, who is King Rehoboam, all the way to the 14th generation, King Josiah. They are the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay. During the time of King Rehoboam, that is when the nation is split into two, where we have the northern Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Today, we are reviewing the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, and I will be sharing with you the seventh generation, which is King Jehoram, all the way to the 14th generation, King Josiah. The first generation to the sixth generation will be covered in another lesson soon. So, 
before I go into the overview of each kin, I would like to hi, I would like to give you the five key messages. So first, our God is a faithful God. Second, our God is a merciful God. Third, our God is with those who obey His word, and He will prosper them. Fourth, God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud. Fifth, the importance of transmitting our faith down. These are the five key messages that we will see when we do the overview of all the kings in this lesson. So without, over, without further ado, let us go into the overview of each king now. So the first one is the seventh individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Jehoram. Okay, he is the fifth king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Jehoram, this name means the Lord is exalted. The Lord is honourable. He is evaluated as a wicked king. You can read more about him in the reference verses I have stated in the slide. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 18 says, And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Yes, the reason why he walked in the ways of the house of Ahab and turned away from God is because of his marriage with Ataliah. Ataliah is the daughter of King Ahab. Okay, so we can see marriage is actually very important because your spouse can influence your belief and your lifestyle. We see this also in King Solomon as well as King Rehoboam, where both of them had fallen into idolatry because of their foreign wives and concubines. So, he and his wife, Ataliah, they committed idolatry. And his six, he has six brothers. King Jehoram had six brothers. All six of them opposed to the idolatry committed by them. So, when he acceded to the throne, he brutally murdered all of his six brothers, along with some of the officers who supported his brothers. So, you can see his wickedness. Then, Prophet Elijah went to warn him of the wicked deeds that he did and prophesied about his end if he don't repent. But sadly, he still did not repent. As a result, all the nations that were under the hands of Judah rebelled against him. Then God caused him, God strike him with an incurable bowel disease as recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 18. And in two years, his bowel really came out and he died. And you know what? The sad thing is, he departed with no one's regret, as recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 20. He was then buried in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the king. This is great humiliation for a king. But do you know, though he is so unfaithful, our God is faithful. Our God remembered the covenant he had with David, and he was not willing to destroy Judah fully. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 19 says, Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah for the sake of David his servant, since he promised to give a lamb to him and to his sons forever. In his defeat, all the precious things in Judah, Jehoram's wives and sons, were all taken away except his younger son, Jehoahaz. So you see, God kept the lamb going. So in conclusion, lesson learned. Through the life of Jehoram, we can see our God is a very faithful and merciful God. So let us remember his covenant and let us not ignore the warnings of God, but be able to truly repent before him. Amen. We go to the next king, the eighth individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Uzziah, or he has another name called Azariah. He is the tenth king. Uzziah, his name means, the Lord is my strength, the Lord has helped. He is evaluated as a good king, but later, but turned wicked in his latter years. Okay, you can read more about him in the reference verses stated in the slide. 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 3 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. So, 
In 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 4 says, tells us that as long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. Okay, indeed. With that, he was able to defeat many enemies. And he established great military strength and his fame spread afar. Why is it so? Okay, 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 15 gives us the answer. It says, For he was marvelously helped till he was strong. Yes, just like his name, the Lord is my strength, the Lord helped him much. However, after he became powerful, he became proud in his latter years. He entered the temple of the Lord and attempted to burn incense on the altar of incense. We know this, um, this duty can only be done by the priest. So this act is a challenge against the absolute sovereignty of God who instituted the priestly office. So at that time, Azariah was the priest. He, along with 80 other priests, they tried to stop Uzziah from doing this. But Uzziah, he got angry, okay? And he just continued to attempt to burn the incense on the altar of incense. So, what happened to him? Leprosy broke out on his forehead and he became a leper and remained leprous until the day of his death. Because of his leprosy, he had to, he had to live in a separate house. Okay, this is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 5. So, lesson learned. We see that God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34 says, Towards the scorner, he is scornful, but to the humble, he gives favour. When Uzziah humbled himself to sought the Lord, God's strength helped him. But when he became proud, you see, he stood in opposition to God. And that is so sad. Okay, so as we are serving God today, let us remain humble always and sought the Lord. Remember, Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. So let us start well and continue well all the way. Let us be able to remain humble throughout in our entire journey of faith to sought the Lord. Amen. We go to the next king. This is the ninth individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Jotam and he is the 11th king. King Jotam, Jotam, his name means the Lord is perfect. He is evaluated as a good king. Okay, you can read more about him in the reference verses stated here. 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 34 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that his father Uzziah had done. So, wow. Uzziah suffered leprosy, his father suffered leprosy for 12 years. Jotam, his son, attended to the state affair as a regent. Okay, a regent basically is someone who is selected to rule on behalf of the king due to special circumstances, such as the king being too young or he suffered an illness. So during this time, King Jotam, he witnessed all that has happened to his dad and he took it to his heart. Okay, he resolved never to enter the temple of the Lord and actually never did. Okay, this is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 2. In 2 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 6, the Bible recorded that Jotam became mighty because he ordered his ways before the Lord his God. To order one's way before God signifies living according to the word of God. Yes, today we must live according to the word of God. Let us pray like David did in Psalms 25 verse 4. May this be our prayer too. It says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your path. Amen. So King Jotam, he is a good king from the beginning to the end of his reign. However, the high places were not taken away. 
And sadly, his faith is not transmitted down to his people. So his people continue to commit evil, as recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 27, verse 2. As a result, God sent King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, king of Israel, to attack Judah in the latter years of Jotam's reign. So lesson learned. Number one, God is with those who obey his word and will prosper them. Secondly, we see the importance of transmitting our faith down. As leaders, we need to go out there to spread the word and bring people to Jesus Christ. Jesus commanded us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So may we all truly go out there and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, to the next king, the tenth individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Ahaz. He is the twelfth king. Ahaz, this name means to grasp, to take hold, to seize. He is evaluated as a wicked king. Once again, you can read more about him in the Bible from the reference verses stated. So, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 1 to 2 says, Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David had done. But he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. He even made metal images for the bows. Yes, he followed the abominable ways of the Gentiles. He did many things. He made molten images of Baal. He burned incense in the valley of ben Hino, even burning his own sons as sacrifice. Then he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places, on the hills, and every green tree. Do you know all this that he did are detestable things that God hates? And God specifically instructed the Israelites uh, not to do all these things in Deuteronomy chapter 12. You can read about it. Secondly, he did not rely on God, but on the army of Assyria. Assyria is a very powerful nation at that time. So at that time, Aram and Israel, they came together to attack Judah. God spoke through prophet Isaiah and warned them not to rely on Assyria. Okay, and to even convince Ahaz to believe in this, right? Prophet Isaiah asked Ahaz to seek a sign to prove that it is true, but King Ahaz refused to seek a sign. But our God, he is a faithful God. He himself provided a sign, and that is recorded in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. This name Emmanuel affirms that God will be with the southern kingdom of Judah and take care of them even amidst all hardship. This also points to our Lord Jesus Christ, who will come through the virgin and be with his people. See the grace and love of our God. He is so faithful and he really loves us. He will surely fulfill his promise. But sadly, even after God showed him the sign, King Ahaz, he still did not believe a single word. He rather send his treasures and be the slave of king of Assyria than to trust in God. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 8. Thus, God gave Ahaz into the hands of the enemy. Then later, another invasion came, that is, the invasion of the Edomites and the Philistines. Ahaz, he still relied on Assyria once again. You know what? Assyria, instead of protecting Judah from the enemy, right, they afflicted Ahaz. It is so sad, right? Isn't it? So never trust on man. Do you know all these attacks were allowed by God? Because God wanted to humble Judah. God will certainly humble, discipline, and judge those who are disobedient to his word. Okay, this king Ahaz is really wicked. So during his time of distress, instead of really repenting and turning back to God, he became even more unfaithful to God. 
2 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 23 to 25, it tells us what he did. Really very wicked. Let me read for you. For he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus that had defeated him and said, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them that they may help me. But they were the ruin of him and of all Israel. And Ahaz gathered together the vessels of the house of God and cut in pieces the vessels of the house of God. And he shut up the doors of the house of the Lord. And he made himself altars in every corner of Jerusalem. In every city of Judah, he made high places to make offerings to other gods, provoking to anger the Lord, the God of his fathers. And that's not all. Worst of all, he changed the pattern of the temple. We all know, right, the, pe the, temple, uh, the pattern of the temple is decided by God. So his action of changing the pattern of the temple is a great sin that challenged the authority of God. You can read more about this in 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 14 to 17. As such, when he died, he was not buried in the glorious tombs of the king. This is also a humiliation to him. So lesson learned. Despite man's unfaithfulness, our God is faithful. We can see God giving King Ahaz an even surer sign of the Emmanuel. Our God is faithful and his promise will surely be fulfilled. So today, all of us are waiting for the second coming. May we cling tight to God and be faithful to him till the end. Secondly, let us ask ourselves and reflect. Have we been relying on God or relying on this world? Whenever we are in trouble, who do we turn to first? Do we come to God first or do we go to the person whom we think can solve the problem for us? Let us remember, be it small or big matter, let us come to God in prayer first, then to depend on our own human race. Psalms 146 verse 3 to 5 says, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On the very day his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose help is in the Lord his God. Amen. Okay, we go to the next king now. The 11th individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. This is King Hezekiah. He is the 13th king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Hezekiah, this name means, the Lord is my strength, the Lord is strong. He is evaluated as a good king. You can read more about him in the reference verses stated. 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 3 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. When the Bible mentioned that they followed or did according to all that his father, David, had done, this shows he is really a very good king. Why? Because David, he is the quintessential good king who had done right in the sight of God, meaning he is like the best among all. Do you know, the Bible actually devotes the most writing to King Hezekiah among all the kings of Judah and Israel. This shows how much God favours King Hezekiah and want to talk about him. So, now let us learn about what he did. Firstly, King Hezekiah boldly carried out religious reformation. He repaired the temple in the first month of his first year. This shows this is what he deemed as the most important thing. Secondly, King Hezekiah, he worshipped God. And sin offering, burn offering and thanksgiving offering were given. The, the assembly brought in so much offering that there were not enough priests to skin the burnt offering. And all this happened quite suddenly, right? Do you know why? Because in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 36, it tells us that because God had prepared for the people. See, when we have the heart to worship God, God is so happy. And actually, God will prepare all for us. Praise the Lord. Next, he had Judah and Israel keep the Passover. As we know, observing the Passover is a command of God. And this keeping the Passover has been neglected until then. Hezekiah believed that keeping Passover is an act of returning in complete submission to God. Though he is the king of the southern kingdom of Judah, he remembered his brethren, the northern Israel, 
they are also the children of God. So he sent his men and write letters to encourage them to come and celebrate the Passover together. So we can see his heart over here. May we be like King Hezekiah too, remembering all the people of God. They had two weeks long of Passover and there was really great joy in Jerusalem. Next, he destroyed all kinds of idols. He did it very thoroughly. Okay? In fact, he was the only king up till his time that removed the high places. Okay? Thus, obeying this command recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 11 to 14, saying God commanded them to take care that you do not offer your burnt offering at any place that you see, but at a place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. So see how thorough is his reformation. He really remembered the word of God very well. Okay, may we also do so. Amen. Next, he re-established the offering and the tithe. Hezekiah, he commanded the people to bring the first fruits and the tithe of all the produce of the field so as to provide for the priests and Levites. This is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 5 to 6. As a leader, he set a very good example by first giving a portion of his good. So this example set by the leader aroused the obedience of the people. So his reformations, it's mentioned that this is good, right, and true before the Lord. This is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, verse 20. Why was King Hezekiah able to keep all the commands of God? 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5 to 7 tells us the answer. Okay, that is, for he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses. As a result, and the Lord was with him. Wherever he went out, he prospered. So we see God is with those who held fast to him and kept his commandments. So may we be the people who held fast to God and keep his commandments. Amen. Next, all of a sudden, after the Reformation, God gave Hezekiah a fatal disease. God told prophet Isaiah to pass the message saying, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. Upon receiving this death sentence, do you know King Hezekiah, the first thing that he did was not to look for any doctors to heal him, you know. He turned his face and prayed. This act of turning his face and prayed signify that King Hezekiah, he gave up everything in this world and just to concentrate fully on relying on God. So God heard his prayers and see his heart. God healed him immediately and God extended his life for 15 years as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 6. Then, now, when everything is good, God would like to test his heart. So God worked behind an incident to test him. Okay? God sent the ambassadors from Babylon to go to him. However, instead of giving glory to God, right, he showed off his achievement by showing all that was in the treasure house, the treasuries, and even the armory. He did not give glory to God. He did not give thanks to God. This is because his heart, he has turned proud. Okay? As such, God sent prophet Isaiah to relay the message that all that he has shown to the Babylonians will be transferred to them. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 17. After being rebuked, King Hezekiah is really a good king. When he's being rebuked, he humbled himself and repented. As such, God promised that the wrath would not come upon King Hezekiah in his lifetime. This is stated in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 25 to 26. So we can see how important it is to be a humble man, right? Then next, in the Bible, it was recorded that King Hezekiah went to battle against Assyria twice. The first invasion happened on the 14th year of his reign. Okay, King Sennacherib of Assyria invaded Judah. Okay, 
this first invasion, King Hezekiah did not trust in the Lord. And sadly, he paid the huge price of giving 300 talents of silver, 30 talents of gold, and the gold overlay stripped from the doorpost to the king of Assyria as a tribute. Then, there comes the second invasion. Okay, King Hezekiah, like I mentioned, is a very good king. So he learned from his mistake, and this time around, he trusted the Lord fully. Okay, and not only that, he encourages people to trust the Lord. Let's see what he says. Okay, in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 7 to 8. May this word also encourage us today. Okay, he says this, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him, for they are more with us than with him. With him, him referring to King Sennacherib, is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Indeed, when God fight the battle, who can win against him? Nobody, right? So may this give us courage too. Our Lord is with us and He will help us fight our battles. Amen. But at the time, the Assyrian's king envoy, Rabshakeh, he used all kinds of wicked words to try to weaken the hearts of the people. In this distressed state, right, King Hezekiah, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth and entered the house of God to pray. He also got Eliakim, who was in charge of the king's household, Shepner, the scribe, and the elders of the priests to also cover themselves in sackcloth too. And he also sent them to get the prophet at that time, prophet Isaiah, to pray too together. Do you know, to tear his clothes and putting on sackcloth is an act of faith expressing complete dependence on God. Through this act, King Hezekiah, he is confessing that he was nothing before God. So when they come together and pray and God sees their heart, what happened? Do you know God sent the angel of the Lord to strike down 185,000 enemy troops? This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 35. So amazing, right? And isn't it so good? They do not even have to fight. God fight it for them. So hallelujah. So lesson learned. Number one, we need to remember the word of God well and cling tight onto God. Then God will be with us and we will prosper wherever we go. Secondly, be humble. Remember, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. All right, we go to the next king. And that is the 12th individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Manasseh. He is the 14th king. Manasseh, this name means to forget, causing to forget. He is evaluated as a wicked king. Once again, you can read about him in the reference verses stated here. 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 2 says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the despicable practices of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Do you know, King Manasseh, he was the most wicked king among all the kings of Judah. There are 20 kings in total. He is the most wicked king. So what did he do? Basically, whatever his dad, King Hezekiah, has done right, right, he did the opposite. So he rebuilt the high places that his father, Hezekiah, had destroyed. He, um, he also worshipped all hosts of the heaven. He made human sacrifices and consulted the mediums and spiritists. He misled his people to do even more evil than the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the sons of Israel. And you know what? In 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 16, it says, He shed much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another. Scary, right? And the worst transgression is he actually built altars for idols, where? In the inner and outer court of the temple of God. This is recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 5. Really wicked, right? As such, the Lord spoke to him and the people, but they would not listen. As a result, God proclaimed 
that he will bring about a horrible judgment. And this is a judgment that has not, that has been unheard of in the past. Okay? 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 12 says, Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Jerusalem and Judah such disaster that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. Indeed, it's a very scary judgment. So what did God do? 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 11 to 13, you can see what happened next. All right, let me read for you. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them the commanders of the army of the king of Assyria who captured Manasseh with hooks and bound him with chains of bronze and brought him to Babylon. Yes, and when he was in distress, this is when he lost all his honour, his wealth, his power. When he's really in such a low state, King Hezekiah realized his mistake. And in verse 12, it says, And when he was in distress, he entreated the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. So when he humbled, we see what happens next. In verse 13, it says, He prayed to him, and God was moved by his entreaty and heard his plea and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. So from here, we can see that God really gives grace to the humble. So what is true repentance then? True repentance entails a decisive act of willfully forsaking the former sinful ways of life. Yes, so in Isaiah 55 verse 7, it tells us we need to forsake our evil ways. Okay? Yeah. So after repenting, what did he do? Because he must carry out his entrance, right? He removed the foreign gods and the idols from the temple of God. Remember the worst transgression that he did? Yeah, so now he removed these foreign gods. He also broke down all altars in Jerusalem. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and gave peace offering and thanks offering. Furthermore, he also tried to order the people of Judah to serve and offer sacrifices to the Lord God of Israel only. Okay, you can read more about this in 2 Chronicles chapter 33, verse 14 to 17. So we can see Manasseh, he has truly repented. So lesson learned. Our God is a merciful God. He forgives us, really, when we repent truly. Even King Manasseh, who is such a wicked king, the most wicked king, when he repents, God forgives him and still include him in the genealogy. This gives us hope, right? So let us truly repent before God today. Secondly, true repentance entails eradicating the source of sin. We must be resolute not to do back the same mistake again. All right, we go to the second last individual, and that is the 13th individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Amon. He is the 15th king. Amon, his name means trustworthy, faithful and skillful. He is evaluated as a wicked king. Okay? So 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 20 says, And he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, as Manasseh his father had done. So King Amon, he witnessed both his father's wicked ways and the punishment on him, as well as the father's repentance after that. However, sadly, he chose the wrong path. He took after his father's rebellious ways, as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 21. So he abandoned the Lord and did not walk in the way of the Lord. As a result, his servants conspired against him and he died a wretched death. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 23. So once a person for, has forsaken God, whatever protective measures that he may create for himself will be useless. King Amon, he is a king, so he should be very safe in his own palace. But who killed him? It's his servants, right? Yes, Psalms 127 verse 1 says, A song of essence of Solomon, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labour in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, 
the watchman stays awake in vain. Yes. Sorry. Fortunately, at the time, the people of the land, they killed those who conspired against King Amon and made Josiah king in his father's place. Once again, we see our God is a faithful God, right? And he kept this group of people over there who is faithful. So, these people, as recorded in 2 Kings chapter 21, verse 24, they made Josiah, his son, the king in his place. These people of the Lamb, they are armed with faith in God. They earnestly believe in God's covenant, the Davidic covenant, and they desire for the Davidic dynasty to continue on without ceasing. So they made Josiah the son to become king. So lesson learned from King Amon. Number one, the end of those who forsake God is always very tragic. Number two, we must be like the people of the land who remember God's covenant. Let us protect and carry out God's plan to fulfill His covenant. Amen. All right, we come to the last one, who is the 14th individual in the second period of Jesus' genealogy. He is King Josiah, and he is the 16th king of the southern kingdom of Judah. Josiah, this name means the Lord supports, the Lord encourages. He is evaluated as a good king. You can read more about him in the reference verses stated over here. 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 2 says, And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father. And he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So as mentioned earlier, for those kings, that were mentioned who walked in all the way of David, his father means he must be a very good king. And if you realize in this verse, there is an additional command for King Josiah, and that is, he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Taking such commands into consideration, we can be certain that he truly lived a godly life before God. May all of us today also live a godly life before God and be acknowledged by God and receive the good evaluation too. Amen. So let's look at what he did. Okay. He became king at a very young age. All right. He became king when he was just eight years old. All right. So at the time of his reign, the entire kingdom was full of idols and the temple of God was desolate because of Manasseh and Amon at the time. But do you remember who made him king? He was only eight years old. Who made him king? It was not his wicked dad, but it was the people of the land, those people of faith, right? So these people kept their faith in God and believed that they had positive influence on bringing up Josiah to be a faithful king. Then Josiah started to seek God at the age of 16 years old. Then at the age of 20, he started the religious reformation. He started to purge Judah and Jerusalem by removing the idols. And he assumed the bones of those idolatrous priests and he burned them. His reforms were nationwide, is very thorough, and he destroyed all the idols. You can read more about his reforms in 2 Kings chapter 22 to 23. In total, uh, he took six years to remove all the idols from the land. It is not a few days, it's not one or two years, but six years. It is really a very long period of time. So you can see how thorough he did, right? So he is really very faithful. Secondly, at the age of 26, in the midst of repairing the temple, they discovered the book of the law in the temple. And when the book of the law was read to King Josiah, when he heard it, he tore his clothes and wept. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 11. This act of tearing his clothes and wet is an act of repentance and humbling before God. Because King Hezekiah, a King Josiah, he humbled himself before God, God promised that he will not see the end of the disaster that God is going to bring on this place. This is recorded in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 18 to 20. 
Then what did Josiah do next? Josiah, after hearing the word of the Lord, right? Josiah, he called and gathered all the people and they went up to the temple together. Why must they go to the temple? Because the temple is a symbol of God's presence and reign. It is the holy place where God meets with his people. Then Josiah himself, he read from the book of the covenant in the hearing of the people in the temple of the Lord. After reading the word, then he renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. Okay, what did they pledge? Let me read 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 3 to you. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 3 says, And the Lord stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. What do they pledge? To walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in the covenant. Wow, amazing, right? All the people also pledge themselves to this covenant. Furthermore, King Josiah, he also celebrated a grand scale of Passover according to the word of God. Then next, what happened? During his time, Egypt intended to battle Babylon at Carchemish in order to aid Assyria and prevent Babylon's southern exp expansion. Okay, so Nico, the king of Egypt, he had to pass through the Palestine region in order to get to Carchemish. But at this time, Josiah, he really uh, hated Assyria, okay, because of the past. So Josiah, he took an anti-Assyrian stance. He collided with Egypt in a battle. Pharaoh Nico, he then sent his messenger to King Josiah to state, his, to state clearly his position that his enemy is actually not King Josiah. And God is actually the one who sent him to go and aid Assyria in this battle. So 2 Chronicles chapter 35, verse 21, it says, okay, But he sent envoys to him, saying, What have we to do with each other, king of Judah? I am not coming against you this day but against the house with which I am at war. And God has commanded me to hurry, cease opposing God who is with me, lest he destroy you. So you see, here Pharaoh Nico, he says very clearly, and he tell him it is God who commanded him to go. And he keep repeating, telling uh, King Josiah not to oppose uh, against him whom the God has sent, right? But King Josiah, he was adamant on making this war, right? He did not listen to the advice. He did not listen to the word of God. He disguised himself to fight in the battle. And in the end, he was shot with an arrow and he suffered a severe injury. He eventually died upon arriving at Jerus Jerusalem. So one thing we can see is that when a word is relayed in the name of God, we should listen carefully. Even if this word comes from the mouth of our enemy. In order for us to discern right or wrong, first of all, we need to know the word of God very well. And instead of just saying, no, because he's my enemy, I will not listen to him. I think we should really come before God to pray and to really hear God's voice, hear God's advice. So the lesson learned, number one, all of us, we have both inherited sin as well as our own self-committed sin. We need to truly repent before God. So when we truly repent and humble ourselves before God, our God, He is a very merciful God. He will really forgive all our sins. Secondly, we must listen carefully when a word is relayed in the name of God. So we have come to the end of the overview of all the kings, from King Jehoram to King Josiah. In conclusion, I hope you still remember the five key messages that I have shared at the start. Okay, through this overview, I believe you see these five key messages repeating itself again and again. Our God is so good. 
But we men, we are wicked and we are very forgetful. So God got to keep reminding us again and again. So here I am again, reminding you all of the five key messages. So first, our God is a faithful God. Regardless whether we men are faithful or not, our God, He is faithful. And He will fulfill all His promises and covenant to complete the salvation of His elect, which is you and me today. So we just need to cling tight onto Him and believe in His covenant. Second, our God is a merciful God. When we repent truly, He will forgive us. So have hope, just repent. Third, God is with those who obey His word and He will prosper them. Fourth, God gives grace to the humble but resist the proud. Fifth, remember the importance of transmitting our faith down. Our God, He is our Father. He really loves us so much. That is why from the beginning, He already planned His redemptive work to save us. And as a parent, you know, when your kids are naughty, right, the parents will discipline the kids. When the parents discipline the kid, does it mean the parents do not love the kids anymore? No. In fact, it's because the parents really love the kids. The parents need to discipline the kids in order for the kids to realize his or her mistake and for them not to do this mistake again in their life. Same thing. Our father, he really loves us, right? So, he... We can see from this history, he gave many warnings to Judah and he kept forgiving them. But when God saw the sins of Judah reach its fullness and to a point that it could not be undone, therefore, in order to discipline them so that they can be, they can be purified and receive salvation, God has to punish them. God has to discipline them. So God allowed them to be taken as captives into Babylon after the time of Josiah. This is to train and purify them. But remember, our God is a faithful God. This is definitely not the end. God promised to bring them back after 70 years. So you see, our God is really faithful to fulfill His covenant. Today, we are all under the training by God to become pure and holy so that we can enter the kingdom of heaven. So let us really cling tightly onto God, help fast onto Him, and believe in His faithfulness. Let us not turn to the right or to the left, but let us just focus on God alone. Amen. All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with a heart of thanksgiving. You are such a faithful God. You are such a merciful God. And Father Lord, through this study, we really receive much hope, Lord. When we repent truly, you really will forgive us of all our sins that we have committed. And this really gives us hope and comfort. Help us, Lord, to cling tight onto you, to hold fast tight onto you, Lord, and remember your word well and obey all your word. Lord, when we are not able, may you make us able. And Lord, we also pray that, Lord, you help us to keep our faith throughout this entire journey. Help us to remain humble throughout this entire journey of faith so that, Lord, you are always with us and wherever we go, you will prosper us. We thank you so much for everything, Lord. And all this we pray in our dear Lord Jesus' name with full thanksgiving. Amen.